All right, hi everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, for the sake of the camera, this is the San Francisco My School Meetup Group. Um, tonight we're gonna have Tim from Palomino, uh, I told you I'm gonna butcher the name. <laughs> Palomino uh, talking to us about sharding um, open source MySQL solutions. Um, upcoming for January, we're gonna take the month off, uh, take a little break, a lot of people are out of town anyway. Uh, for February, Theo has something to say about it. Hello, everybody. So uh, in January, we are going to be meeting at Eventbrite for, uh, um, was well, February, sorry. In February, we'll be meeting at Eventbrite for some MySQL talks. And we're going to have Brian from Square. And I'm going to botch his last name. So I won't even do that. But it's going to be really fun. And we'll have a few other speakers, too. So be there. It'll be fun. All right. Thank you much. Um, our sponsors, uh, IGN, as usual, they provide the food, the facilities, my time. Um, AppDirect provides Aaron's time. Um, they have a, a t-shirt we'll be raffling off tonight. Uh, we'll also be raffling off two books from O'Reilly. Um, so they do some sponsoring as well. Um, I'm assuming sponsors and of course Palomino for speaking, uh, which is awesome. Uh, and with that, we usually open up the floor. Is anybody looking to be hired and wants to make an announcement? Awesome. Anyone else? All right. Anyone looking to hire people? I know kick size here. So. Awesome. And you had something? <clears throat> awesome. Uh, anyone else? All right. So with that, we'll turn it over to Tim and uh, learn something new. Well, it's good to see we have a lot of out-of-work DBAs and nobody hiring. All right, so um, do I need to stand back to prevent feedback? Or can we turn that maybe? All right, cool. Um, so this talk, if you, want to, uh, if you want to follow along a little bit later on, you probably want this URL. It'll, it'll get you happy. Um, and I am a little bit, can we still hear me? Everyone's still here? All right, good. A little bit jet lag because as uh, Lane mentioned, she lets us work from anywhere and I abuse this privilege. I've been hanging out in Europe for about the past month. And uh, Europe's kind of a cool different place. I don't know, have, who's been to Europe? Anyone been to Europe? Yeah, right. They have McDonald's there. People go in on purpose. It's like good times. But uh, so I went, I actually went to a pub and was, was hanging out and listening to people talk, right? And you listen to people here talk from somewhere else. They're not speaking English. Say again? I was in Barcelona, which is in Spain, for those of you that were educated here in the US. Barcelona's in Spain. And uh, uh, no habla espanol. Pero these guys were not habloing espanol either. They were, they were speaking something. I couldn't figure it out, right? It's like, so around here, I've got it all sort of Japanese, Korean, all that stuff. But these guys are speaking, I don't know, it's Russian. No, it's not Russian. It's, it's I don't know what they're speaking. So finally, I, I decided to go over and ask them, like, what, where are you guys from? And the guy's like, Scotland. <laughs> Got it. That's why you can't identify the language. So, um, so what are we, we, like, so we are <coughs> database administrators. And this is, this is one of our key things. We, um, we work the way your company works. Uh, we've got good DBAs. Uh, this is the, the point of what's going on. We, we're globally distributed, and we, we were this way on purpose. Um, we're just month-to-month -month contracts. We do a bit of DevOps. You've, I'm going to talk a little bit about this, so I won't linger on it here. And we do a bit of what I'm calling Ops Dev, which is just silliness that I got from one of our clients. Um, but it's, we just do big database clusters. 
I am Tim Ellis. Um, I've worked, I'm working at Palomino on our big data strategy. Uh, I did some data warehousing at a company called Riot Games. This is a League of Legends if you play games. Biggest online game in the world, so lots of data there. Built the back end for Firefox Sync. Uh, led some DB teams at Dig for a while. And um, I went to, this is, this is a fun point of mine. You know, I actually hung out at a Reddit party wearing my Dig shirt to see if I get beat up. And, and I didn't, alas. Next time, maybe. Um, I made sure Dig and Friendster became big successful companies. And Riot Games and Mozilla and StumbleUpon, I actually worked there for a bit. StumbleUpon's actually across the street now. I don't see anyone from StumbleUpon here. We are. Huh? We are. We're, oh, that's right. We're at StumbleUpon. Why did we not bring anyone? So um, here's another point. If, if you guys want to ask questions, just do so. Don't wait till the end. You know, interrupt me. It's all good. Um, I'll, I'll try and work through this quickly. I've got until 9. Is that correct? I guess I should establish that earlier than 9. OK, so I'm going to 8.30 raffle, and then I will talk. If people have questions, they have questions Got it. So you've probably you're probably hitting this even um, I mean this seems to be happening everywhere your your database isn't big enough so you're starting to shard right I'll talk just a little about about what a shard is and what shard types you can pick um, but this is this is the other half once once you've decided to shard you've got to build a bunch of shards you've got to administer it right you got to deal with shards going missing and adding new shards in so how do you do that? We'll talk a little bit about um, Palomino Cluster Tool, which is how we build big database clusters. And then we'll talk about JetPants, which is how you administer them later on. So there are kind of two types of large clusters. This is, um, I've worked a lot with this first type. This is what I worked with mostly until kind of in the last five years when we started getting Cassandra, HBase, things like this to do distributed databases. I'm going to talk more about the first type because I think more people here are going to be interested in that. Is anybody here running distributed databases quite a lot and interested in that kind of aspect? You have right, the other Palomino guy. Okay, you are as well. So we'll probably, afterward, we're all going to sit around talking. Feel free to find me and talk. I'll talk more with you guys about HBase and other such things if you so desire. Tonight's going to be mostly MySQL. I don't know why. I just felt like MySQL would be a good thing to talk about. So we'll talk a little bit about theory. We'll talk about building a cluster. We'll talk about administering a cluster. And this actually, um, I'm going to hurry through this last bit because I only have until about 8.30. So distributed databases, I think a lot of people think of these as silver bullets, right? And um, silver, <laughs> you're right. Well, some of us don't think of them as silver bullets, usually the ones who've looked into it, right? Um, and I'm not sure why is everything a silver bullet, right? Like this is, uh, this I guess is why we have the phrase, you know, if all you've got is a silver bullet, then every problem starts to look like a werewolf. I think that was the phrase. And, uh, and so you'll hear that kind of conversation going on, right? Like, oh, our, our disks are full. The, the uh, capacity of our, we're hitting the capacity of our cluster. And the boss is like, what, moon is full? You're being attacked by a hairy monster? Got the silver bullet can take care of this shit for you. So these, these are kind of what you, you'll hear from the, from the PR folks. Free sharding, awesome. Uptime, uptime and scalability for free. Don't have to worry about it. But um, MySQL is kind of part of this RDBMS tradition. It's been around for a while. It's stable. Um, NoSQL is pretty young. And if you look at kind of where the outages come from in the past few years, there's a lot of people running on the bleeding edge and kind of paying the price. So keep your eye um, keep your eye open on or keep your eyes open on what the actual disadvantages are as well as the advantages here. So, but that is that's not to say ignore distributed databases. Kind of you you want to be keeping your eye on these things like they're. There are some pretty cool things, and we've got some. We've got several clients now running some big distributed database clusters as well. So, um, and we find that it can be quite useful. Um, 
it's not free. There's going to be your downtime. And this is this is something important. If you guys are interested in database uh, distributed databases, find me afterward. We'll talk about uh, the new ways of administering and how how these things, uh, how this kind of plays out in an organization. So, does anyone here not know what a shard is? Shall I raise your hand if you want to go into what sharding is a little bit? I would like to look at that. Yeah. Okay, we got a couple. So, a shard is. If you if you take a database and you break it up into pieces, each shard is itself a, a number of pieces, typically redundant. So this is kind of what it, one thing that you'll typically do early on is you'll take a, a type of database or a type of schema or a type of tables, put them on their own shard. A shard is a master of slaves in, in MySQL. That's usually the way you do it because replication's free. Um, you know, go ahead, go to town. And so this is a typical kind of thing that I see in a lot of different organizations. Um, so then I guess I'll cover these slides in a little bit of detail as well. So you'll have different ways of sharding. One is what you call, or what, yes, I guess people are generally calling this kind of by function sharding. And that's where you take a certain type of tables that seem logically to fit together and are busy, and you put them onto their own master and slaves. So the rights of these go onto the busy hardware. The remaining rights stay on your current hardware, but your current hardware then does a lot less work. You are distributing the rights this way. Then there's a column-based sharding. That's where you take a big table and you split it into chunks of related columns and then put them on separate database clusters. Then the final way is taking it by rows. You can take, say, a modulus of, your, um, of a hash of your row key and then just store the different rows in, different, um, in, a, in shards where you're taking the row key and um, doing a modulus of in on the hash of the row key. You look like you might have a question. OK. <laughs> All right, good, good. So this. Functional and column-based sharding is usually quite easy. Like you, uh, a lot of times your workload, this just makes sense. You look at it and you're like, yeah, here are some tables, or here's a table I can split into chunks. And so this is a good way to start, and this will get a lot of organizations through several years. Um, it's, it's a common pattern. I've seen it in a lot of different clients. And uh, JetPants, the tool I'm going to be talking about in a bit, actually considers this and, and assumes this is a very common use case, probably because they had it also at Tumblr. Uh, but eventually you run out of options, and so you have to think about row-based or, um, yeah, row-based uh, sharding. It's the hardest to do, but um, it is, it's the hardest to do. It's got several ways of doing it. I'll talk about those here now. So to pick a functional split to do by function sharding. You're looking for a set of common tables. So typically, you'll have, say, a user table and related user tables. Or you'll have, um, a po in the case of blogging, you'll have some post table and related posts uh, related tables. And so you can take them and put them on their own shard. So that you also are looking for tables that are rarely joined to other tables in the database. And it doesn't have to be exclusive. It just needs to be rare. Uh, you're looking for ones that have several or most of the rights are responsible. Now keep in mind, once you do this, you're going to have to rewrite those joins into code-based multi-select, right? Uh, does anyone not understand what that would be? Is this an easy concept? Cool. I'm seeing lots of nods, no shakes of the head. Excellent. Um, this I think I already had mentioned. So another functional split that you'll see is sometimes index-based. So you have a, a table with, say, 10 indexes on it. And you, have, you can split your queries into ones that use these sets of indexes versus those sets of indexes. So you'll end up with two shards that have the exact same table but two different sets of indexes. And that'll split your index write load. Um, this is really common in OLAP and OLTP, right? So somebody's they've created a they've created a slave and they're running the reports on this particular slave, 
you can start adding indexes or dropping indexes on that slave that would never work in, to add or drop in the OLTP system. Very common thing to do. Um, then you'll have, then you actually have to figure out how to split your queries. And sometimes people will treat indexes sort of like materialized views doing index coverings. So this is, if people are starting to do that, creating, or developers are creating lots of indexes, then this is a useful way to, to accommodate them. So, if you want to break your table into two parts, what you're looking for there is a table with lots of columns, typically a user's table. Um, everywhere I've ever been has a giant user's table. Um, so you're looking for something with lots of updates. Again, a user's table typically is this, and of course, many indexes. You need to, you need to be able to split these columns apart by the frequency that they're being modified, but you also kind of are looking for a logical grouping, something if you can come up with a good logical grouping as well, then your developers will be happier long term. It's very difficult after you've made this split, if you don't do a logical set of columns on each one, new developers have much more train up time before they get how to work with your system. Um, and that's something that I ignored early on and developers did get a little upset at me. So, you know, learn from my mistakes. These, uh, the, yeah, this, this is true of any sort of sharding. Your, your joins become much more difficult or impossible. So you want to make sure that you don't need joins. Whatever queries did have joins, you're going to be rewriting those often as select one thing. Based on that, select some other things from the different cluster in your data access layer. So you've got several choices with row-based sharding. This is the difficult one, and so there are multiple ways of doing it. The uh, easiest one is the range, I should say, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in my experience, the range-based sharding is the easiest. It's also easy to understand. You're just saying each shard gets a range of rows. So you've got a million users. This shard gets the first 200,000. This shard, the second 200,000. You have five shards. You split the users across. But this causes hot shards. Typically, if, if you do exactly what I said, well, the most common or the most busy users are the ones that just joined and the ones that have been around forever typically are less, uh, less active. And so you'll end up with the first shard is very idle, the, the last shard's very hot. So then you end up having to split these hot shards. And um, typically also you are taking cold shards and joining them together. So as you keep getting new users, you start taking those old or lower numbered shards and you join those together and you're taking the high numbered shards and splitting them apart. And juggling this load is kind of a frequent process. Does, it, does anyone at Zendesk want to say how often they do shard moves? <laughs> right, okay, he doesn't want to say, but um, this, let's just say a lot of people when they do shards, uh, do sharding like this, moving shards around is a very frequent process. Um, this does, in my experience, this is typically the best solution. It's the good mix of understandable, workable, um, but also um, has a good enough performance for people's desires. However, there is something that typically is better performance. It's a little bit harder to understand, um, or I should say harder to grok. You have row keys. You take the modulus. You stick them on uh, however many different shards. You rarely have hot shards. This is, it's very difficult when you, when you um, randomly distribute your data. It's very difficult to end up with a hot shard. However, shard splitting is very tricky. So we recommend you don't do it. We have a process at Palomino, Palomino that, we, that we use. So we over allocate shards. So what you'll do is you have, say, 256 shards, but you put, um, I don't know, 64 shards on each machine, or I should say 64 shards, logical shards on each physical, excuse me, 64 logical shards on each physical shard, right? So then if a machine is overloaded, then you actually move the shards from one, the logical shards from one physical shard to another physical shard. Yeah, I know, right? It's a little, a little crazy. <laughs> so, but 
if you ever do run out of shards, like you do have, say, 256 shards, one of those has a client that's so busy that it's overloading that physical shard and you actually do have to do a shard split, it's a very painful process. And in my experience, that's a multi-week process. And it's kind of hard to kind of figure out that balance. Do I want 256? Do I want a million shards? Do I only want 20 shards? Or like how many of these do you want to do? It's a little hard. We find somewhere in the hundreds is a good rule of thumb to start with and then tweak it from there based on your expected growth and, and usage patterns. So then there's one last row-based charting method. I'll, I'll power through this one. It's lookup table-based charting. So you just say, uh, the, this row key is going to be on that shard and there's a lookup table that tells you that. So it's very easy to move the move data around. You just stick it on another shard, update a row on the lookup table, done. However, it's a single point of failure. It can be slow. And if you're sharding, you're probably uh, working with multiple millions or perhaps billions of rows already. So then this, uh, this thing itself becomes a candidate for sharding, which is kind of silly at that point. You've, you're, you're kind of you're starting down the rabbit hole, not gonna make you happy. Gonna power through this one too. Basically, getting hardware can be a little bit of a challenge. I suggest you start small and, and then build something successful and work up from there. Or get your hardware in the cloud. The only issue with the cloud is you'll see hardware failure and hardware flakiness far more often than if you have your own hardware. So just be prepared for it. Um, we, we have both sorts of customers, lots of EC2 instances and lots of in-house hardware. So it's workable both ways. Just keep in mind it's a little different. All right, so now we're actually gonna talk about hardcore tech stuff. This is where if you want to follow along later on at home, you'll wanna look at this terminal output and the screenshots, um, the PDF and HTML. Yes, take a picture. I'll actually put it up at the end too, so if you don't get this now, you'll be able to get it later. Being recorded, Being recorded. oh right, for posterity. <laughs> Hi mom. <laughs> so once you've got the hardware, what are you gonna do with it? Um, you can just log into all the, all the hardware. Say you have 50 machines, just go install MySQL on all 50 of them and start sticking your schemas on there, that's gonna, you're not gonna be happy. You can do SSH and for loops. People do this all the time. That's called rolling your own config management. I don't recommend it. Uh, or you can learn a configuration management tool. So there's three I'll talk about now for about two minutes. Uh, I've worked with Puppet, Chef, and Ansible. So Puppet I've been working with, or I did work with for a few years back at DIG, and we, worked with hundreds. Do you remember how many was it was? Like 600 some odd servers? That, yeah, right? Yes, so it's, I found Puppet kind of painful. We had a full-time guy, but you know, one full-time guy working with 600 servers is better than, than uh, doing it in SSH and for loops, trust you me. Started working with Chef a couple years ago, worked with it about a year and uh, use that to do dozens of servers and don't let, don't let the, uh, <laughs> right? Don't let, those, don't let those Ruby on Rails guys trick you and say, no, we use Chef, you don't have to know Ruby to use it. No, you need to know Ruby. You need to learn a bit of Ruby and be, become happy with it. Enjoy putting colons in front of your variable names. And then Ansible I started working with six months ago um, at Palomino, again, doing about dozens of servers. Um, and this is what we've, the first bit of Palomino cluster tool was using Ansible. We now also have a fairly large chef component, which I will talk about here in a second. Yes, go ahead. Which of which two? Of these three tools, which do I prefer and why? I would have to say I'm most happy with Ansible. Uh, I'm going to probably I'm going to say why here on the next slide. So let me get through this and we will see if I answer your question. Um, this might invalidate my reasons. You might find Chef good. If you're a Chef shop or if you're like a Ruby on Rails shop already, then Chef is a natural choice. Uh, and 
I don't think, if you are already a Ruby shop, I don't think there is anything better. I, I would uh, just go ahead and use Chef. Uh, Puppet's very mature, it's been around a long time, has a very active community, probably more active than the other two combined. Uh, but Ansible, tiny and modular, this to me is very important. Uh, it's similar to Puppet, um, but it does have ordering, which means it's both configuration management and deployment, where the other two tools, I, yes, right, both, neither Chef nor Puppet claim to be able to do deployment. They are only for configuration management. Um, then one, one thing to note is whatever tool you choose, you're going to have to look around for the, the kind of code that essentially modules that are pre-written to do what you want to do with them. And this is where the Palomino cluster tool is going to help out. I'll talk about this about now. Say again? Ansible is a Python project. It's modules are whatever you want. So if you prefer to write your modules in COBOL, uh, who's, who's a COBOL fan here? <laughs> anyway, it, Bash, Python, Perl, Ruby, whatever you want to write it in, uh, the modules can be done in. Uh, Chef, I'm pretty sure it has to be Ruby, but I may be mistaken. Does anyone, does anyone here speak Chef? It has to be Ruby, you think, too? Yeah, I'm not 100% sure. Okay, so in Puppet you were writing ERB. Yeah. Okay, so I did not I did not know it was a Ruby based yeah. templating thing. Okay, cool. I guess that's what you get when a, you have a full time guy doing it is you don't have to know these details. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Puppet and Chef essentially are Ruby. Ansible is whatever you want, but the core is is Python. So I have been building big database clusters for a while. People keep asking me, you know, can you build a, you know, 100 machine database cluster for me? And I'm like, yeah, sure, no problem. And I, you know, I worked with Puppet, I worked with Chef, and now I've been working with Ansible. And so I was like, wait a minute, well, instead of writing this yet again and keeping it to myself, can I open source this? So I asked Lane, who kicks ass. And she was like, hells yeah, open source that. So on GitHub, we have this Palomino cluster tool. You can, when, what I'm gonna be talking about tonight, you can do. So like, if, if right now somebody comes to you and says, I need a hundred machine database cluster with seven masters and then all the slaves with failover, and when can you deliver that to me? Probably realistically, your answer is weeks um, to maybe about a month and a half, right? Um, you should be able to do that now in a matter of two or three days, max, potentially a couple of hours. You should be able to configure about a hundred machine um, database cluster, no problem. Beyond that, it just starts getting weird because, um, well, I may not talk about that, but Ansible may not be able to deal with more than a few hundred machines. So if you don't want to remember this URL, just Google Palomino Cluster Tool. It's Google knows about us. They've learned, they've learned us. We've been incorporated into the Borg. Dun, 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 dun. Who here does not know what MHA is? Really, everyone knows what MHA is. You guys are better educated than the Percona people. I got about half the people didn't know what MHA was. That's, that's interesting. All right. So I won't talk about MHA. So the first thing you got to do is you got to build a management node. Um, this will just have a Palomino cluster tool bit. It'll have a jet pants bit, and it's going to be where you would stick your trending and alerting stuff. To, all right, let's go back, back. Um, all right, okay, I guess that's basically what I just said. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. So we used Ansible to start with. Here's, what, here's where I answer why I like Ansible the best. There is no server, it just uses SSH, so it's sort of a glorified SSH in for loops, but it, it does a fair bit more of like error checking and, and parallelizing and things that you may not have, that, or that you might find difficult if you rolled it yourself. It's got non-code playbooks, so you, you kind of, like Puppet, you express what you want to do and it does it. And if you have to extend it, write it, 
in whatever language you want. For a demo, this is obviously the, the thing to do. You're going to go from a blank management node to a working puppet, in, or excuse me, a working Ansible install in about five minutes. It's production worthy, I'd say. So it's built by Michael DeHaan. He came from Puppet Labs. And so you'll find a lot of kind of Puppet Labs based methodology in the architecture of that project. So uh, what I recommend if you're going to try this out without your own hardware, just try it in EC2. You can get 20, 30, 40 instances, build it, you know, whatever your budget allows for. And so that's what my assumption here is. You're going to put your management node in EC2. Uh, I would make it Ubuntu 12.04 unless you have very good reason to try otherwise, although I'm pretty sure it would work on CentOS. Uh, I haven't tried it personally. So just to minimize your hassle, use that. Uh, T1 Micro is perfectly fine for this management node, which is the smallest, cheapest uh, EC2 instance you can get. And what you do to install, every, well, I guess everything's going to use Git. So you'll need to put Git on there. And then Ansible is going to use Python, Jinja2, and Make. So you're going to install those. And if you have an ops team delivering things to you, we'd just specify this and make sure your management node had that. That's kind of the, the pre-building your cluster bit that is required. To install Ansible, you get clone, you make install, and then you're done. And I've tried this on multiple versions of Ansible and on CentOS and on uh, Ubuntu 12.04, and I've not had any of the typical make install problems that you probably are familiar with, you know, missing this dependency, missing that, error here, error that. No, none of that. It's just make install. It does work. Then to install Palomino Cluster Tool, you get clone the project. And then you're done with the management node. Like this literally will take you about 10 minutes from allocating your node to having it ready to start building your cluster. Then you want shard nodes. These, these need to be bigger. These need to be like real database machines. I've actually written the, the Ansible bit to work on the M1 small, which is 1.6 gigabyte, the my.cnf with the NODB um, buffer pool size and Etc. are all tuned so that it will work on 1.6 gig, but um, you know, for a real cluster, you better bump all that up. Uh, the chef recipes actually assume a little bit larger size. Make sure these ports are open between things. Uh, with EC2, you just put them in the same security group and then make all the ports open. Uh, make sure they're Ubuntu 12.04 again. And then uh, you do some minimal OS configuration. What I recommend here is use a tool called Cluster SSH. It's available on Mac and Linux. I don't know how to do it with Windows. So this will just let you open up a shell to all 40 of your machines and do the minimal bit of configuration you need to do to prep them for the cluster. That is, put the SSH keys on them and enable root login. So enabling root login, um, I thought I'd share this with you because it was a little weird. Um, there is, oh right, these, this resolution is way too small. When you log into your EC2 instances and you look at your .ssh authorized keys file, your key that you created the instance was with will be there, but there's going to be this code at the beginning of the key saying basically, no, don't let you log in. You got to delete that text from your authorized keys. Now, again, if you follow along with the, um, if you follow along with this, essentially, the, the terminal output is kind of a screen grab of everything I did. You'll see all this, so don't worry about forgetting it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be obvious when you follow along on your own. Ah, there we go. Too many keys. And that is really all the work you're going to do manually on the EC2 instances. Um, and again, if you were doing this for reals, and you would be asking your operations group that when they deliver you a machine, that it has passwordless root SSH access. And that's kind of scary to a lot of sysadmins. They're going to be like, what? Passwordless root SSH? And you're like, yeah. Because I'm using MHA and I'm using JetPants, and both of those assume that I can do passwordless root SSHing. And so, yes, your sysadmins are going to hate you, but that's kind of what 
what is going to happen. So I'm going to power through this because uh, this was actually kind of a tutorial, which now I'm compressing down a bit for presentation. But the idea is there is a little bit of configuration you do. You stick some IP addresses into your um, configs for a Palomino cluster tool, and then you run some scripts, and these scripts go and build one based off the IP addresses you put in the config files. They go and build uh, put MySQL on the machines, they put MHA on the machines, and they configure all the, the, the configuration scripts so that it'll actually be functional. Mm -hmm. And this I will also just power through. So for this tutorial, uh, if you do this at home, one thing that's important is JetPants assumes that uh, spares are not replicating that, how should I say, the, the machines that are not participating in your cluster, the extra machines sitting there are not participating in any replication chain, but Palomino cluster tool was built to create replicated um, sets of machines. So it still saves you time to create a bunch of replicated machines and break the replication over manually configuring it, but just know that there will be this stage of breaking replication. Um, and all that, all that involves is removing a read-only directive from your my.cnf and going and doing a um, reset slave on all of them. E there we go. So one thing, that's, one thing that's kind of cool about JetPants, we're kind of getting into the administering portion now. Now that you've, once, once you get through those past slides, you've built a You've got a functional large cluster, but now the real world stuff starts hitting you like my shard is hot and I need to split it, or this, this shard has a failed slave and I need to recreate a slave for it, things like that. So one thing that you'll want to do in your testing is simulate a large amount of data coming into your cluster. So you fill it with a, a script that does these things. Um, I just included a generic little Perl script that does a crap ton of um, inserts into your data clusters or into your cluster so you can do a shard split live and, and see how it does it in great and gory detail. So the idea, and I'm going to back up a little bit because I powered through the slides. I didn't have time to, or I didn't really give you the overview of what's happening. What you're doing is you're building a large database cluster with a Palomino tool. Then you're inserting a bunch of data in your one shard. So you've got, essentially you've built one shard and a bunch of other extra databases that aren't participating in this cluster yet. You're dumping a bunch of data into that first shard. While that's happening, you can start installing JetPants. You haven't actually installed a tool to administer this cluster yet. And I recommend doing that so that you'll have a realistic amount of data in that first shard when you do your shard split. Installing JetPants is as simple as installing Ruby and then installing JetPants with Ruby gems. Yay! Um, so this is probably not worth talking about here, but there will be some steps to make Ruby work uh, on EC2 if you use the Ubuntu 1204 um, instances. Right, okay, so once you have JetPants installed, then you edit a couple files. So they, there are, JetPants has a way of talking to a particular inventory system of tumblers, and it also has just a generic um, JSON? Yes, JSON based, no, 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 YAML based, that's what it is. A YAML based um, inventory file as well. So. No, I'm, I'm so, so lying. The YAML is the configuration, the JSON is the, is the inventory file. So what you're going to be doing is creating both of those things because you probably aren't going to, for a demo, install their um, full inventory system. Ah. So you'll edit this file, you'll um, create the, the um, inventory, and you'll... Um, Oh, that's right. There's one other thing I forgot to mention about JetPants. It also assumes that your application code can read a YAML file to determine what the masters and slaves look like. 
And so it will generate that file for you so that you can hand it over to your apps and they will understand what's going on. And this is useful for when shard splitting has happened. You don't have to use their, you don't have to use their output, but it's a useful and handy thing. And so if your applications can parse YAML, then you're good to go. And I walk us through a shard split, which I think I will not go into detail in here. But the idea is there are some commands you run it will cause a shard split to happen. Um, you will stick a bunch of spares into, I'm sorry, we're setting up the shard. We're not doing the shard split yet. We're sticking in a bunch of spares. And these are the commands to actually do it. Then we give it a shard split. And this is, this is the interesting part of JetPants here. So a shard split is you've got, um, You've got a shard with one, you've got a million users, right? One to a million. And now you want to take the first 500,000 and stick them on this shard and take the other 500,000 and stick them on that shard. Or more likely, you just want to take this 500,000, leave them here and that 500,000 and stick them on another shard. So JetPants makes sure that you only have to run a few commands to do this. And it will take care of all the things like making sure that there's always a master available for your application to deal with, making sure that there's always a slave available, making sure that after the split that there's no extra data left over on either of them and, and that no data is lost. All that kind of um, devil in the details, nitty gritty realistic stuff that you have to deal with if you were to write this yourself, JetPants is taken care of. So go ahead. So the question is, in JetPants, when you're doing a shard split, you're moving data. Moving data is typically risky, especially in that often that data is read only or perhaps not available at all. So you want to know what the mechanism is there. All right, so what, what JetPants does is it's assuming you have a master and two slaves for any given physical shard. And it also assumes that a single master has enough read and write capacity to satisfy applications talking to that physical shard. So you have to follow that rule. Basically, if, if taking one slave or both slaves out of that pool would cause the application to be unhappy, then you need more resource in that shard. And so what it does is, based on that assumption, it says, OK, it's cool for me to take down one of these slaves and then do crazy stuff like dump all the data out, do it in a locking fashion so that that slave reads that came to it would suck. But that's fine because one of the things JetPants is doing is reconfiguring the applications, giving them a new config saying what they can read and write to. So one of the things it'll do is make sure that that slave it's going to shut down is not in that config, which so and it, it kind of helps you through this process saying, OK, you need to get this config out to your apps now. OK, is it out to the apps? Got it. OK, now I can go to this next stage where I'm taking this slave out of the. Right, so the question is, um, if I am moving a particular record to a new shard, and during the process, a write comes to that record, what happens? So what really goes on is um, that slave is a slave of a master. That slave is locked. The data is copied over to a new shard. Then both of those, I'm sorry, a new slave, both those slaves are slaved to the original master. And so they will both, once the replications turn back on and the slave lag gets back down to zero, they'll both get any writes that are made. Then at a key moment, the, the software says, OK, this 
shard is responsible for the actual, I'm sorry, yes, this shard is responsible for this record, this shard is not, so this, the writes are sent, um, God, how should I, so at the, So this, this new shard is going to be the master of that set, right? So at the cutover moment, writes coming to, that were coming to that record and replicating here are then sent here instead. Then this is not allowed to get writes that were replicating to it until it is, or how should I say, Ooh, yeah, I might have to go into, I might have to talk about with you with this after because now we're getting to the point where I'm not sure that one bit, how it makes sure that any write that came here after the point where it's going to make it the master. Right, so there's going to be, there's going to have to be some mechanism. I know this is taken care of, but now I'm starting to wonder exactly how that happens. Right, but, yes, correct. Yeah, what happens is the very last step is the, it, the, the data is duplicated, right? But then this one is author, uh, authoritative for, say, you know, the last half of your million users, and this is authoritative for the first half, but they both have all of them. So what ends up happening is it deletes the data here for this one and deletes the data here for that one. So then in the end, you don't have any duplicated or extra data, but, but I still don't... Say again? Yes, but what I'm wondering is it gets, say it gets fully caught up and then it, right in that millisecond that we say we're going to do this cutover, one more write comes in here. So like what does it do? Does it lock ranges? You know, I guess I'm going to have to figure that out because I don't actually know the answer to that. I know it's taken care of, but how, I don't know. Sorry. But that is a very good question, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. So how they make it atomic, I'm going to have to go look up because I don't know. So this is, again, details that I think if you work through, you will get, you will take care of. But, right, SSH, passwordless root SSHing has to happen. And the... And I have in the terminal output, I have that being tested at this point. Um, one thing to mention, this is probably useful. This is something I didn't know, that, but JetPants doesn't have any way of knowing. When you tell it this shard is responsible for IDs, say, 5 million to 10 million, it doesn't have a way of knowing that your last ID is maybe only 5 million and one. Um, but it assumes if you are splitting, say, a shard that you say is responsible from 5 million IDs into two, then it will try to break that data into half, so 250 million each. And if you actually only have, say, 10 IDs, but you've got it responsible for 5 million, it'll say, okay, one's going to be responsible for the first half which includes all your data, and the other is going to be responsible for the other half, which includes none of the data. So when you are defining your shard minimum and maximum IDs, you want that, those IDs to be roughly what is really the case. If you have 10 million users, you want that max ID to be about 10 million so that when you do a shard split, it knows how to break that data up and most efficiently use the, the um, hardware while it's doing the split. Um, this, I don't think I made clear in these slides. So, you will do a shard split, and we've got about half an hour until a, a um, raffle. Oh, you give me a rule and then you tell me it's just, I can break it? You want to break it on your own? <laughs> right, well, well then I'm just going to keep talking. I like hearing myself talk. Woo! <laughs> 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 
All right, so um, the purpose of the next couple slides is to say something that I found kind of interesting. So I was using, I was kind of building, I built a cluster tool and it made a big cluster and I was happy and then I'm like, how am I going to administer this? And then we, we heard about JetPants. So I started talking to the JetPants author and um, there were some differences in in the what I had built and what jet pants could work with. And so it was just, it was kind of fun to interact with the author. And this guy really loves his tool. Like he is, he is really uh, responsive and, and takes great ownership of this thing. So I recall several times, you know, three in the morning or whatever, I get done with my hack session and I'd email this guy and go, well, here's some problems. And I figured, you know, sometime the next day I'd hear from him and like 20 minutes later, he's like, all right, dude, I fixed it. You know, go do another gem install thing or it'll install the new jet pants and then that, that bug will be gone. And I was like, man, what are you doing up? And he's like, well, what are you doing up? I'm like, yeah, okay, good point. So, but it was kind of cool. Like he, um, so they are rel or CentOS, I forget which. Um, shop at Tumblr and I was doing this on Ubuntu and so there's some differences in, in the service command, where it is, what its output is and we, we kind of fixed those bugs. Um, he, they run MySQL 5.1 at, at Tumblr and I was building my stuff with 5.5 so there were a couple little um, differences there but n nothing big but it was just kind of cool that, that dude was working on it. it the most god awful hours, and sometimes I had jet lag. I'd wake up at four o'clock, wake up at four o'clock in the morning, and go, and dude would still be awake. So I'm not sure when he would sleep, if ever. So another thing that was quite interesting was this this demo. I would only have a few hundred megabytes in my shard before I do would do a shard split, but he had some uh, timing issues where it was like there's no possible way this step could happen in under ten minutes. And you know, it would complete in three minutes and the code would be like, all right, I'm doing this next thing, but the last thing was not done. Right, so it would, it, would, it would do things in the wrong order essentially, which caused big problems. But then he was like, no, no problem, I'll fix that. So uh, here's kind of a quick list of things that we worked on in October and got fixed. That was, I think, in this, course of about like a week. So if you guys are using jet pants and it's not working for you, email the guy. I'll bet you a dollar. He'll uh, make it work for you. So if you are not that excited about um, traditional MySQL and you're, you're ready to go with distributed databases, this is kind of the next section of this talk where I'm kind of leaving behind that and talking about MySQL based distributed databases. So you can use something called Gizzard, it comes from Twitter. And what it does is it's kind of this middleware that does the sharding for you. Um, you have your applications connect to this thing, it does all the connections. If your shard needs to be split, it splits it. If your shard has hardware that fails, it figures out how to put in the new, uh, the new hard, uh, the new copy of the data for you. It, it deals with all that, which is kind of cool, I guess, except it is even according to Twitter insiders a little bit uh, rough around the edges. But it is better than rolling your own like um, complete sharding or generic distributed database sharding solution. So if the engineers are like, no, we don't want any of that um, functional sharding or column sharding that pretty much we just got done talking about and they're like, we need this, but MySQL is our thing, this would be a good, good choice for you. Um, why you should use it? Well, same as anything else. Your master's running out of capacity. Uh, you aren't able to do the other simpler sharding things, and you want to keep using this one server that you know and love, right? But the good news about um, Gizzard is you can actually use any storage backend, I think think except for MS Access. Does anybody here use MS? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I, I mean, I listen to myself sometimes and I'm like, really? Did you just say that? 
OK, so I was joking, just so you know. Fox Pro. Fox Pro. That's not a joke. That's, that's, that's Pro. <laughs> Woo. So uh, there are some problems, though, with Gizzard. And that is um, writes need to be item, item potent. They need to be commutative. And that doesn't matter what time of day. They have to be commutative. And there's problems with diseases. So now so let, me, let me talk seriously a bit about item potency. So the idea here is if you write if you submit a write to your cluster, like you can't be afraid that it's just going to submit it again for you a couple more times. And um, so all your writes have to be identical to doing it once. So this would be a case of bad. And I'm a, I'm, I've been doing databases for a long time. So the first thing I see when I see this, even though I wrote the slide, is like, who forgot the where clause? And it's like, no, 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 that's not, this is, you know, I couldn't fit the where clause. The font is so huge. So the problem really is just that you're setting the column equal to itself plus one, which if you submit it again, it's going to be plus two. And if you submit it again, it's plus three. And your data is going to be all hosed, right? So you need to also think, well, if it, the, the, or, the writes can come in any order. So if I set the column one to something, and then I set column two to something else based on column one, that may not work, because that second write may come first. And this is actually one of, this is actually true of a lot of distributed databases. If your distributed database has an eventual consistency aspect to it, you don't know for a given read, you don't know if it's consistent unless you use a particular type of read. And Cassandra gives you one where you can force it to be a consistent read. But it's often slow enough that people don't use it. They accept this, that you may just get an old value. And it's actually a whole new way of thinking that you sometimes are like, well, I'm going to ask my database a question. And it may give me a bad answer, but that's OK. It's really hard to wrap your head around it. But you probably want to if you're using Gizzard. Um, when is that going to be cons ever? Like, does anybody here follow politics? Like, I hope not, because man, you're just going to be as insane as me. Um, so, what they recommend at Twitter is you just kind of stick a timestamp with all your transactions. So, what you basically do is say um, this this timestamp is one. Okay, now update the column to 42, and then set the column 2 equal to the column 1, where the timestamp equal 1. And if you do this, then it doesn't matter what order these things come in. If you, you run that second update, it's going to be like, oh, well, there is no timestamp 1, so I'm going to wait for a while and, until that first thing comes through. Now, if your DBMS doesn't have column attributes, then you're kind of hosed, right? So you can actually implement it. There are ways to implement this in MySQL, but it's not going to be, it's not going to be trivial. You've got to think about it. Your applications are going to need rework. Your schemas are going to need rework. It's not a trivial, easy thing. And to do it, well, it's, what do you do? How's, <laughs> how do you do Twizzard, Twitter's Gizzard? Yeah, right. You learn Scala, seriously. You learn Scala. You clone this Rose DB on GitHub. There's your, that's your thing. You clone it. Then you modify it to, to work. And so this Rose has all that, uh, all the shard splits and shard things abstracted, so you don't worry about it, right? It's, it's ready to go. That's going to become your middleware. You also want to learn how to interact with your tools. You're going to want to write some monitoring and alerting. You're going to write some unit tests. Ding ding. QA lady is not getting excited right now. I'm, I'm <laughs> confused. You're not, you're not in QA. Oh right, now you're like oh, unit tests. I don't know what those are. So, and then you would want, you'd probably want to OSS this thing at the end because you're not going to want to maintain this yourself. You're going to want people to help you with it. So, sounds pretty daunting, right? Um, but, right, don't, don't roll your own. Seriously, this is, this is one thing if I can impress on you guys, don't roll your own anything, right? Use what's out there and extend it. You're going to be far happier. You're not going to, you're not going to pay the price of dig. And I mean, I think, I would have to say this is probably one of the biggest aspects of what, what hurt dig the most is just we 
tried rolling our own and it didn't work. And so then we're like, okay, well, let's use this other thing that we don't roll our own. And that was a little painful on its own, but way less painful than our initial attempts. So then there's, uh, this is the last thing I'll talk about as far as um, distributed databases based on MySQL. So YouTube, anyone here heard of YouTube? So um, it's, it's a, uh, I don't know what it is. Yeah, right, the, the, the tubes, the intertubes, and it's not a dump truck in any case. So uh, they made this thing called uh, v Vitesse and VTalk. I'll just pronounce it like that, why not? So it's, uh, it's another middleware solution. It's for sharding. It does, some, it does a little extra cool things that Rose doesn't. It does this caching connection pooling. Uh, it has some fail-safe features, which if you are running a high-volume website, you're going to find compelling. That is, wow. Uh, it will do this, this killing of queries that use too much resource. And this might make you a little nervous if you're a DBA. Like, and this took me a long time to grasp when I was at DIG, but it's actually better to kill some queries and let bad results come back to that connection then let the whole site suffer for somebody's bad query. So this will do it for you automatically. And I've written tools to do this kind of stuff, so it's great now to see somebody else has written it and open sourced it. It, uh, it does its own query <coughs> caching. Is it better than what we have in MySQL? That is the theory. Right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? I'm kind of like, dude, query <laughs> cache. That's awesome. Zero query cache. Give that give that thing some RAM. So no, they, they have they claim a better implementation, and I suspect it's true because they actually run a lot of queries in YouTube. Uh, they they I don't I'm not sure my SQL's query cache is really confused by comments, but maybe originally theirs was. This is a nice feature of theirs. It strips off the comments. Yay. Uh, now this is actually kind of cool if if you are in a high volume shop, you'll constantly see this multiple queries, the exact same query coming to your database multiple times. And so because this is middleware, um, what, what, if you have naive middleware, you've got a large um, set of, a large cluster, it'll just spray that same query out to like 30 different shards. And so all 30 shards are working on the same query. This thing will go, oh wait, some shard is working on this. Let's just wait for that answer to come back. And then I'll give you the answer, I'll give both of these connections the same answer. And then they have zero downtime restarts, which is kind of cool. Um, this one, way less coding. You're not going to do like Gizzard. You're not cloning a tool and making your own distributed database. No, it's a true middleware. So this is actually kind of cool when I was reading about how their zero downtime restarts work. You just start this new VTalk instance and then uh, instance one goes into what they call lame duck mode and if you ask it a question it's just like oh no there's another one it just hands the query over it gets 30 seconds to complete the things that it was doing before you started that second instance and then it the second one kills the first one and then life goes on and you're like wow that's kind of cool that things didn't stop however this is where this is where it kind of sucks all your primary keys need to be var var binary which actually kind of makes sense. Like, if you're an international multi-language company, like, you just kind of want to treat things as by a stream of bytes. Uh, you do need to carefully choose your key because if you, uh, this is actually something that happens in all distributed databases. If you pick a time-based key, for example, then typically everything hashes to the same spot. So even though you have random hashing, you still end up with a hot shard. Um, and if anyone wants to talk about that more, find me after. We'll have a long discussion about it. Uh, oh, this, this is actually a shortcoming of the language Go. So uh, if you allocate memory in Go, you cannot deallocate it. You're stuck with it. So because result sets fit in a buffer, it allocates a maximum buffer size. And anything larger than that, and the, the query will fail. And it's kind of half a feature, half a bug. It's not a horrible bug. It can be useful sometimes. And then you have extra work. You're going to have developers saying, look, my, my code is dying because of your middleware. What's up? So be, be aware of that. 
And then sometimes things just kind of fail and you don't know why. And it, it can be a little harder to diagnose when you've got an extra component in the mix like that. I am, you know, I'm not sure, but if it didn't log, I would be extremely surprised. This is, yeah, I, if it did not log when it killed a query, I would, I would just, I would come out of my skin. That would just, I'd be like, whoa, because it is YouTube. Like, they, you would log things like that all the time, yeah. If it doesn't, please let me know, I, but I don't know the answer to your question, honestly. So implementation details, and I'm just going to cover this in a little bit because there's a much better and thorough description on their website. Um, but you are going to have to know what your expected load is to set a connection count. And um, your connection pool and your transaction pool are actually two different things. So if something requires a transaction, you actually put it in its own special pool. and there, uh, then you set your query and your transaction timeouts for when to kill those queries. Set your max result set size and rows. This is, oh, I, oh my goodness, I spoiled the, the plot. Look at that. And then this is the page you would go to to find more details about it. And that the PDF I'm going to show you at the end has all these URLs so you don't have to think about it. HA proxy. So this is, this is a cool little thing that you probably want, who does not know what HA proxy is? I know you know what it is because you are awesome. Anybody who not know what HA proxy is? One. I think that's enough. Oh, and Rob's like, yeah, me, I, oh, okay. <laughs> so HA proxy is just a free open source proxy, um, load balancer. So the cool thing about having a free and open source load balancer is the old way you do it is you'd get an F5 or you'd get a net scaler and you'd spend $80,000 and you'd stick it in there. And what, what, what it would do is it would make life awesome for you because you'd have all your clients on one side. They just have one IP address. They don't care what client they're connecting to. They just do it. But then that's a single point of failure, which kind of sucks. So what you end up doing instead is you buy two net scalers or two F5s or two whatevers and you set them up in this bazaar with their own special cables between and, and then you run some special software and you hire a dedicated guy to make sure it's all set up right and then when it fails you know he's on vacation and so it takes seven hours your site's down and that's wonderful but what HA proxy does is change all that a little bit. Instead you stick your HA proxy on every single one of your nodes and then they figure out how to connect to the database servers and that's awesome because there's no single point of failure and you don't spend hundred what is 80,000 times two you don't spend a lot of money on like these dedicated weird pieces of hardware you just stick something on your servers so instead you need configuration management for your proxy because you don't just change the proxy in one place now you're changing it in however many database clients you have and a lot of people have hundreds or yeah, hundreds of these things. It's a pretty typical thing. So definitely you've learned Ansible or Chef already, so you're going to just use it, right? So now I got some q and A. I I got time for uh, questions. We've got 10 minutes if we want to stay on schedule, and we've got more if we don't. So here are some good questions which I suggest asking later. Anyone? Bueller? Vendors have been trying to build clustering into the systems. Uh, will they make all this stuff up to The question is, will vendors who are selling clustering solutions make all this obsolete? Probably, I suspect not. Um, it seems like if you have well, if it's open source, then probably not. If they're just selling like their own kind of services on top of that, it is very possible that all this becomes obsolete, right? And essentially, that's really what we're doing, right? If, I, if I've now taken it from the point where it might have taken you six weeks to create a 100 node my set of MySQL machines to one week or actually a couple days with some practice, 
well then potentially I've got now a whole room full of people with 100 node MySQL clusters and at some point you're going to be like well this is actually an awful lot of work you guys want to help us out and and that's kind of what we do we help out you know one month or two months or three months at a time so um, but yes it's always possible that we will become obsolete and, and that's that's something I stay up at night and worry about but it's okay because the jet pants guy is also up at night so we can hang out I'm the only, no, there's other developers. So if you actually look at the project, um, there are two major sections. One is the Ansible bit that builds either MySQL plus MHA or HBase clusters. And then there's a Chef component that builds HBase, uh, HBase clusters. The Chef component was all 90, 80, 80% written by Riot Games um, coincidentally, it's not, it's, yeah, I guess it's not coincidentally. I'm, I have a little bit to do with it, but largely they did it on their own and they open sourced it. And I was like, cool, we need that. So I incorporated it into our project. So it's definitely not me. It's something like eight people in total now, but there's no reason it cannot be more. It's very open. You join the mailing list. You say here, I want to create I want to create puppet manifests to build on CentOS. I'm like, cool. I would love to have someone participate like that. Can you go into sharding? Like, if you've got a user's table that has uh, keys that you're doing joins against other tables, and you spread that out against like 10 different tables, how are they unique and all still being masters? So the question is, you have a user's table that you've sharded into, say, 10 pieces. So the user's table is in 10 pieces. How would you join that to another table? Each of the users, so if they're all still masters and you're still writing to all 10 of them, the, the unique uh, user ID would constantly change. Like when you shard, you have to change the way that your, your application would pull data. So for instance, I guess let me back up. So like <laughs> I have a user's table and I have, say, 100 users. Okay. And I'm joining based on the user ID being one, 200, and then I can pull all the other information from other tables. But I guess I don't really understand how the application will look at a sharded so the, cluster. It's, okay, so you've got a user's table with a bunch of users. You've split it into chunks, an arbitrary number, let, let's say 10 because I like 10. You've got 100 users and 10 shards, so there's 10 on each shard. And you want to know if, say, you're talking about user number one, and you want to join user number one's data from other tables? So actually, if I've got all 10, I've sharded it, and then I'm still writing to each of them. So the first one's 1 through 9, the next one's 10 through 19, 0. OK. Really but like, I guess that's the one that I don't really understand. Like, how, how does this application keep track of that? The unique, unique IDs. I, th I think I'm just not grasping what you're saying. <laughs> so you not after. Yeah, OK. I mean, how does the application know which user ID is in which shard? Well, no, so if you're still writing to each of the different servers, then if they're all still masters after you shard it, or is it just actually going after you shard it? Yeah, generally speaking, the data only exists in one shard, so you're not writing the same data to all the shards. So new data would only write to one and everything else would only be for updates? It depends on how you how you decide to shard. I mean, if you, if you decide to shard by range, you're on. Uh, some component of your app needs to know which ranges map to each shard and when it needs to insert. <coughs> as long as it has that data, it will choose the shard to write to. I think... It doesn't naively spread rights to the entire group of shards. Are you asking, like, okay, if I've taken my 100 users, I've put them in their 10 shards, now I've got the 100 first user, where does it go? No, as you keep adding users. Right, so the 100 first user comes, where does that user go? Is that basically what you're asking? No, it's where all the new ones would go. So I guess right, where does 101 go? Where does 102 go? Where does yeah, 103 right, go? Yeah. There right, so there's two, there's kind of, there's actually three major ways of doing that, right? So the mod, so what he's talking about is the modulus based. So you've got your 10 shards, your 100 first user comes in, what is 101 modulus 10? It's one, 
it's actually zero, but, but anyway, so it's, say it's one, so you'd put it on the first shard. And then where does 102 come in? Well, what's 102 modulo 10? Oh, it's two, so then it would go on the second shard. And 103 comes in, modulo 110 again, it's number three, so it would go on the third shard. And so it's just kind of like round robin in that case. But then there's the other two ways of sharding. You've got the lookup base table where you could just say, every new user that comes in, I'm gonna stick it on this shard. And so you would end up sticking everyone on that shard but then you could just arbitrarily say, okay, well now every new user I want to stick on that shard. And each time you're putting in this essentially like DNS lookup, right? I'm putting user 101 on shard X and I'm putting 102 on shard Y and I'm putting 103 on shard Z and then you have this lookup table to say where it is. And then the last way is range-based sharding. So you would say, well, this, this server is responsible for users 1 through 10 and this for 11 through 20, et cetera, et cetera. Well, then user 101 would go on the 101 to 110 shard, da 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 But if you don't define a 111 to 120 shard and a user 111 comes in, then that would kind of suck, right? You'd, you'd need to have that range defined before it happened. And typically when you have say 100 million users, you can define that range easily, right? You're like, oh, well, this shard is going to be responsible for the next 250,000 users, which is three weeks worth of stuff. So I've got two and a half weeks before I have to make another shard, right? That's typically what you do when you have that range-based sharding, which is what the jet pants would help you do, like doing that shard split. And then also you're like, well, these shards aren't being used, so you'd probably want to join those together. Like it helps you with that as well. Helps? Okay. Thanks. Cool. No problem. What up? Uh, can you speak a little bit about the process of going from uh, doing a demo or a test cluster with how we have cluster tools and going to a production? Uh, for example, say for ease of demo, you want to do Ansible, uh, but then when you go to production, all your production systems are in Puppet. How portable is the work you did on the demo side going to be for production? Right now, that's going to be terrible because um, the, all we have so far are Ansible and Chef set up. So if you are using Puppet right now, you're not, this doesn't help you. Okay, how about Ansible to Chef? Ansible to Chef, ooh, that would be weird. Um, <laughs> I think the general rule of thumb is you want to start with whatever configuration management tool you have. And if that, uh, if that endpoint, if you will, isn't existing in the cluster tool, then it needs to be written where either you lobby me, us, you know, the community, the Palomino cluster tool community to write it, or you write it and just help out the, the community. So there is nothing for Puppet now, but that is definitely on the roadmap, right? We want that because we have Puppet clients. Do we have Puppet clients? Yes, we've got Puppet clients. So um, we want that, but right, that does your, your, your SOL right now. You can only write it, you can only run the demo cluster, or you have to, you have to admit to yourself that you're going to be using two configuration management tools, one that built this cluster and then the other one that we already use. And it's probably not going to be a pretty thing if you do that, but it might be worth it if you wanted to build such a large, cl large cluster and have something pre-written. Um, I could see because largely once Palomino cluster tool is done doing its job, um, there's not a lot left for it. There's nothing left for it to do. Uh, the jet pants takes care of the rest, right? I can think of something. Mm -hmm. You just deploy schema, roll forward, and roll back. I mean, that's QA hat. I forgot to address schema deploys and reverts. The question is, have we had to do schema deploys and reverts? Regressions or rollbacks with with jet pants, I assume. Any technicals? Is that a fairly common operation? Right. So, gosh, we have yeah, we have many ways of doing that manually. I don't. I am pretty sure jet pants doesn't help you with that. 
other than that it's helping you have a master and many slaves set up so that you can do things like um, put your new schema on the slaves of the, of, the, um, of the physical shard and then do a failover from the master to that slave so that it becomes the master. Like I mean, it's helping you with that process, but it isn't, it isn't that high level yet. It's still kind of like a tool that you use to kind of do the bits that you, I guess it's kind of, I'm kind of having a hard time putting that into words, but right, it won't do that for you. That's still something you do sort of manually with the help of jet pants. And with, Right, so I guess does it make does it make sense what I'm saying about making the schema change on a slave and then doing a failover at a critical moment? If you have ten shards, uh-huh. Each shard has two slaves. Each right. has twenty servers. So you would want to do your schema change on all the well, I guess this is this can be done many ways, right? But my first thought is I would do the schema change on one of the slaves of each of the physical shards, and then at a critical moment, preferably in the middle of the night or whenever your service is the slowest, take an outage, which would probably be on the order of a minute or so, where I then cause simultaneously across all my shards a master failover of all those, in, the case, in your case, 10, right? all 10 of them I would do the master failover. Then once that happens, bring the service I'm back up. I understand that part, but do I write my own tool that does that? Or is that part of JetPants? Yes, you would, you would be doing that yourself still, yes. <coughs> Alas. And what I found is the smaller companies have to take longer out of the, the big companies that can afford. Right. A lot yes. I've, typically found that as well. <laughs> um, Riot actually took like eight hour outages, which is awesome. <laughs> eight hours. And it can be uh, mitigated depending on the size of the tables and the activity using an online schema change uh, utility, such as Percona Toolkits or in 5.6, the native online rebuild. Are you guys familiar with the Percona Toolkit on PT Online schema change? I see some nods. I don't see any shaking heads. Again, MHA and PT Online Schema Change, you guys are sharp. Mm -hmm. Say again? They were here like two or three months ago talking about it. Oh, were they? OK. I should have been here. All right, well, let's talk. Let's all mingle. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Um, if you're um, sharding, The question is, is this sharding um, influenced by the new partitioning features of MySQL 5.5 and 5.6? Not at all. They're completely <coughs> separate concepts. So this uh, partitioning is kind of a kind of an auto sharding thing in a way, um, uh, but it's not across multiple servers, right? Or do we? Or actually, I'm not. Sure. Do, is is the five five and five six doing federated partitioning? Uh, still, still, single. still on single, right? So it's almost in no way related then. So, because this is definitely across multiple machines, uh, the the whole goal is to use multiple machines where the partitioning, yeah, is like you're saying, is on single machines, multiple drives, typically. Um, yeah. So it's very different. That's, I think, that's a very common thing. We do that all the time, right? It's very. And I'm pretty sure that um, JetPants doesn't have any partitioning smarts. So that, 
there is that part where when the shard split's done, it's deleting all the data. If the data was already partitioned, you could, in theory, drop those partitions instead of deleting the data. I'm pretty sure JetPants doesn't know about that, um, but that might be an interesting feature to add if, if you end up using this and the deletion part kind of sucks. The good news is the deletion part happens from the point of view of the application, it happens atomically. So it, yes, it might take 10 times longer, but it does it on a slave that is not affecting production. So it's not horrible that it doesn't do partitioning right now, other than it just makes the shard split take longer. Good. So the question is, after the shard splits over and the deletes are done, does JetPants do anything smart with fragmentation, etc.? I am almost positive it doesn't. It just simply deletes the data and then says done. My, my work here is complete and awesome. And then you go, wait, wait, no, performance, terrible, optimize, alter. So yeah, I think you still have to manually do all that. Again, a feature that might be nice to let the author know about. And he would very likely code it because that sounds like it'd be easy to code. Yes, sir. Um, could you talk about uh, the, the interaction between MHA and JetPants? Oh, I was afraid someone was going to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> so JetPants does master failovers. There's a command you can say, this shard I need you to fail over to the slave. MHA is, I'm sure you're, since everyone here knows what it is, it's the same concept. Um, I, myself and the author talked about this for a long time and it's kind of now at least on our mental roadmap to add um, MHA slash JetPants um, cooperation. For now it doesn't exist so what, ends up, what you end up having to do is decide when you've got your large cluster, do I want MHA to do the work? If so, then you manually trigger MHA to cause that master failover. And then when it's done, you go to JetPants and say, oh, by the way, you think this is the master and these are the slaves. That's false. This is now the master and this is its slave. And then it it can understand that new typology, but you're manually telling it what you've kind of outside of its purview done to the cluster. And that's probably the way you want to do it because JetPants doesn't have, um, it doesn't have a concept of, of making sure all the slaves are up, you know, all the magic that MHA does to make sure everything is correct. Um, JetPants doesn't. So it needs to like halt the rights and make sure everything gets up to date and blah, blah, blah. Whereas MHA can just, you know, do it. So um, I, would, I would say for now, you want to be doing that crazy, tell MHA to do it, then tell JetPants what you did. Could you use the uh, plugin architecture of MHA to automatically call JetPants and inform it? That is, that is the mechanism that would be implemented when this is done, yes, is to have um, MHA do the failover, have a plugin that goes in and tells JetPants what has happened and it goes, ah, oh, got it, okay, I will take this into account now. That, it, that was our plan for implementing it. As far as I'm aware, has not been implemented yet. I think it's on the roadmap for when more people tell them that this would be a cool feature.